I don't think that I'm going to take very long today. Um, we'll see. I mean, discussions grow, so who knows? This chapter is ostensibly about model building, but I found it's really much more about list columns and how they're useful. And so that's what I focus on more. Um, if we, if you want to do model building, like I do with that in here, but um, I don't go into all like the tidy model stuff and everything. There's a whole other book about that. And in the new edition of this book, he actually pulled this chapter out because of that. But I think there is still useful stuff here. Just um, we aren't going to entirely focus on the model building aspect. So um, given that, though, um, the learning objectives I found in here were to build a linear model to explain some trends in data. Um, very importantly, to ex examine the residuals of a model to identify remaining trends in data, uh, to perform feature engineering to explain trends in data and recognize some re resources to learn more about modeling. And honestly, I, I want to tweak those a little bit before the final publish because there's a lot about just list columns. All right. So, um, so something I did want to point out that is about, about this, that um, this book is focusing more on the exploratory data analysis side of things rather than on prediction. And that's very evident in this chapter that um, we want to uh, uh, use modeling as part of exploration, not so much to predict an answer to something. And I think that was evident. And I realize I, um, as I'm saying all this, that I'm blurring 24 and 25 a little bit in my mind because I read them both at the same time. But anyway, um, but in this chapter, particularly, it's about exploring our data using modeling, not so much about, you know, setting up some engine that can make a prediction giving, given inputs. You could do that, but that's not the focus. All right. So, um, again, throughout this, he uses this model R package. Um, and base R to build all the models. I kept with that for this because um, it it gets the point across without digging too deep into how to build perfect predictive models, which again, that's what tidy modeling with R is about. So, all right. Tom, um, can you make your screen a little bit bigger um, as in like zoom it in? It is, what are you guys seeing? Ooh. Um, what do you, Just what's on your screen? <laughs> Uh, 24 to build the linear model. Okay, um, I, I'll try a little more. Is that bigger? Yes, thank okay. you. All right, then I will not change that. All right, so, all right, what did we do? So we're making a, a subset of the uh, diamonds data set where we, we um, don't look at the, the giant diamonds basically. And then we're looking at the, um, log of the price and of the carrots because it normalizes the data a little bit makes it more or easier to deal with all right and then we're just building a um a model where all we're looking at is the impact of carrots on price because that's like the major thing he did some exploration to find this before um actually doing it in the chapter but i just skipped to okay we see that carrots are the most important thing and so we build this linear model that just takes carrots into account. And I thought this was an interesting um, way to do some exploratory data, data analysis. I, I really like this technique boiled down like this, where it's he builds this model, and then you have the predictions, and uh, you know you can see that that does mostly explain. Like the red is the prediction, the um, Blue is the actual uh, actual values, and it's it does a pretty good job. You know, it, it shows the trend basically, but you can see that it's not like right. It doesn't have it nailed. There's a bunch of other stuff going on here, and so knowing that it's not perfect, what we're gonna do? Oops, is uh, look at the residuals. The residuals are like the the leftovers, the stuff that it the model did not predict. It's how wrong is the model basically. And this is the technique that is really useful is now we just take this diamonds two data set, we add the residuals to it and we can see mm -hmm. like there's not a, a really obvious trend from carrots 
to the residuals that there's something else happening that is causing the difference is the idea that it's not it's it, it, we aren't wrong based on price we're wrong based on something else or sorry not based on carrots we're wrong based on something else does that kind of make sense as an explanation for what we're looking at here i guess um <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm, wa I'm watching eyes because I know it doesn't entirely yet. Uh, it's hard to wrap your head around this. But, I really... but if the residuals are evenly distributed, wait, or is it the magnitude of the it's, residuals? They're, even, they're relatively, like they're, um, they're it, it gets a little bit bigger with higher carrots, yeah. but it's yeah. not, not, it's not a super clear, you know, it's not like it, it's, you know, the higher the carrots, the higher the residuals or something like that. So it's, um, and, right. uh, uh, and so we've captured the, what's going on with carrots. Now we're going to go on and look at other factors. So, hmm. um, the, oh, sorry. And what we're looking at is what happens to the residuals given cut. And we see as cut increases, as cut gets better, the error, uh, goes up and not not just goes up but it's like when the cut is bad our prediction is below what it should be and when the cut is good our prediction or sorry i said that backwards when our when the cut is bad our prediction is um higher than what it should be and therefore the residual is negative so we predict a higher price when the when it's a bad cut we predict a lower cut when it's good cut or lower price when it's good cut and that's what we expect. Like that's what we want to see is this this thing that has that should have bearing on the price has this nice uh, trend up. Um, and that was the part that I kind of skipped is when you look at uh, the trend for cut versus price just without this without taking carrot into account, it doesn't make any sense. It's like um, good cuts tend to be low or I think there wasn't any clear relationship, but in some cases, the good cuts were low. It's because they're very low carrot, the ones that are in the data set. So we want to take the carrots out of the context. Like a giant diamond is expensive, even if the cut is crappy, was kind of what, what this came out to. Um, so anyway, so that's what we see for the cut. And oh, sorry, I'm doing my, um, I, I did a, a little bit of a fancy thing of we're doing the same plot over and over. So I made this base plot that is just the diamonds, the Y aesthetic, and it's the box plot. And then in each uh, each plot, I'm just adding on the X aesthetic. So base plot plus aesthetic of cut. That's what's here. Base plot, aesthetic color. And again, this is um, like it, the higher the letter, the um, uglier the diamond as far as color. And so you can see that J, which is down into like the kind of brownish yellow diamonds, that's in the, the low prices when we get rid of carrots. D is a good color, evidently. Um, and that's up in, uh, you know, that's higher prices. So it's higher than what our prediction uh, tells us it should be. Same with clarity. The more clarity that, uh, or the clearer the diamond, the higher the uh, the higher the actual price is compared to the prediction. Um, and so this whole technique of basically use the initial model of the thing that's obvious, pull that out. And so what you have left is the residuals. And then you can examine those and see, okay, is there a trend? Now, if this were something else, you know, like um, cut, cut's a nice one, that or, or, nice example of, like obviously ideal cut should be the highest price. It's named ideal. Like you would expect that to be the high price. And so that's what we actually see when we pull carrot out, ideal cut is good. Um, I can't remember if I do this in here, but then the idea would be, okay, let's say, you know, looking at these, I think the clearest trend is probably for clarity. So then let's add clarity into the model, pull that out of the residuals and see what we can see in the data of what's, what's kind of left. What else can, can we, um, get out of here um and like i say it's just it's an interesting technique to kind of interact interactively just play with the data and see what comes out because 
uh, I probably should have shown the example of like the clarity plot when you have caret included when you're just doing clarity versus price. It, it's a mess. It doesn't say anything that makes any sense. Or, or I guess the one that is the easiest to interpret is the cut one, which again, obviously a very good good cut should be better than a good cut, and you would think that would be impacted or reflected in the price. But when you look at the raw data, it doesn't look like it is consistently better than a good cut because caret is way more important than cut as far as setting the price. Um, so yeah, just this technique of basically using the model to pull a variable out of the data effectively and leave all the other variables. That's what we're doing here. When we look at the residuals, we're saying, okay, caret we've pulled out. We, we've made a model that just uses a caret to predict price. So if it were the average diamond otherwise at that caret, we know what the price would be. Now let's look at these other factors and see how they uh, impact the price. Does that make sense? Everyone following my thoughts on that? Okay, I'm getting a nods. That's, a, that's nice to see. All right. Uh, one other question. So residuals yep. are the predictions minus the actual data or is it the other way around? I, I am so, like I had this in my head perfectly. It would be the <laughs> actual minus the prediction. Okay. Yes. So that's why um, ideal is above zero yeah. and fair and is below fair zero. Is below. That makes yep. sense. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, and so then we make a diamond model that includes those other things because they tend they appeared to have an impact. Um, we're going to um, make plots of that. And again, I, I pulled this out and made a little function where you pass in the parameter that you care about. And it's going to make the grid of that parameter and then a plot of that grid and put that parameter on X. Um, the the um, double brace thing is a when you program with um, the tidyverse, you can you those double braces let you use the bare um, bare parameter names like bare column names. That's all that means is okay. This is this parameter thing is going to be a column name, so I put it. I embrace it is what they call or what they say. You put the double braces around it. All right. So that's all that means. Again, I just consolidated his code because uh, I wanted to kind of do you know embrace the idea of if you're writing code over and over instead of copy pasting, make it a function. So I made this a function, and it's just going to take this model. Uh, it's going to use this model and look at some specific parameters. So let's look at cut. And in this uh, in this model, when we have a uh, you know a crappy cut, fair, it's it's a low price, low predicted price, and an ideal cut is a high predicted price. Um, similarly, when we have the colors, the J is the ugly yellow color. That's a low predicted price. D is a really um, like white diamond, I think. So that's the high predicted price. And we can look at oop, clarity. And again, as the clarity increases, the price, the predicted price increases. So all of this is like following um, our model makes sense. It's like, all right, that uh, it, there's nothing crazy about this. And um, I don't remember. Well, let's, let's just look at. So now we look at um, what's left. And we can see there's still a little bit going on. Actually, I don't know. There's a lot of under, sorry, a um, lot of underperforming diamonds, <laughs> diamonds that are actually a lower price than um, what we predict. So that might be something we want to keep examining. Um, and then the thing, and I don't remember if I pulled this out or no, but he he goes into, importantly, there are all these ones that are, um, at, so the actual price is, or no, he, he actually calls out these ones. These few that are, the actual price is quite a bit uh, lower than the predicted price. And he's saying that might be a, re a way that you use this model of these ones are super cheap. Maybe I should buy them. Now, obviously with a canned diamonds data set, that's not going to work. But his point is those, you know, these might be ones, specific ones that you call out or you look at, or on the other end, look at these ones where we predicted a price way above what the actual price 
is and look at what features those have. Um, and at that point, I would probably look at those individual one, ones of, okay, color, clarity, cut, and carrots do not predict the price of this diamond. So what is it? What's going on with this one? Um, maybe it's a typo. Like maybe you look at the price and you're like, oh, that looks off, but you know, it's got, it's got the sense to three digits. I'll bet they put the decimal place in the wrong place or something like that. Um, but the get your, I guess you're trying to get it to the point where the outliers are the interesting things, because then you can look at those outliers and say, okay, what's, what's left. Um, a lot of times in real data, those will be uh, data entry errors. They also might be, um, you know, a diamond that is super cheap and that is worth buying, or depends on what you're analyzing. This is the uh, a broken sensor, or maybe it is the route that is that has something wrong, and so we need to fix that. Um, or like for me, it might be a question that uh, has a problem with it. So the students who are um, who understand the material are more likely to get the question wrong. Um, that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, so that's basically what the whole diamond section is about. Again, so I, this one isn't about list columns. That's the next chapter, actually. But this one, um, it's all about you're using the model to understand your data better, not so much to make predictions about your data. It's a little bit, you know, there's a little bit of a fuzzy line there. Um, but I thought that was really interesting. And it's an interesting way to look at things. I think I, I do somewhat naturally do this when I'm analyzing data, but I hadn't formally thought about that this is what I'm doing. I'm basically pulling a variable out one at a time and then seeing what's left. What doesn't make sense? What, um, what kind of does make sense in the leftovers that you know you see that nice clear trend for cut or I guess that way for cut um, once you pull carrots out. So oh cut does have an impact it's just a lower impact than carrots um so yeah that's that that section do we have any questions about that um john i like to to uh, have a look at the function again uh can you sure. uh, go back this there? one oh, here yeah so basically what it was is he did this for cut and then he kind of left it that you could change this and this to cut or to, to clarity or to color. And I was like, okay, I'll do that as a function. Um, so all it's doing is uh, I send in the column that I care about within diamonds two, basically. And it from there uh, figures out uh, what to do with it. You could do this where you send in like the name of the column as a character vector, but it's more fun to, you know, it's nicer to the user to not have to do, um, not have to put quotes around it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I thought, so it's interesting because this chapter is not in the new edition and I, I um, I'm interested to dig through. So there's a new edition that is in the works of ggplot2, or not ggplot2, of uh, r 4 uh, He is actively working on it, I found out today. Like, if you go look at the um, GitHub repo, pretty much every day they have updates in there now. So they're actively working on this second edition. Um, and they took this chapter out, but I have to assume they put it in somewhere else because it is a really interesting concept. It's just, he doesn't want to call it out as its own chapter because it's not about modeling. Like it says it's about modeling, but it's it's about using simple models to understand data, not about making predictions with models. Um, so, all right, next, and they never use this term, but this next section is about uh, something called feature engineering um, within modeling, which is just taking your raw data and finding, um, ways that uh, basically using your brain to make sense of that data rather than just hoping that the model can pull it out. So this whole section, it, we're looking at the flights data, um, looking at the dates of the, um, 
of that data and then looking at the number of flights on that date. So how many flights are there per day? Um, and he starts by build, just building this, uh, you know, this plot of date versus flights. And it's a mess. It's like, that's not something that you would want to model because it's just up and down and up and down. And your model is not going to be any good if you just do it based on date for most cases. Um, and so the whole chapter or the whole section is about, okay, what do we know about dates that your model doesn't just natively understand about dates that we can maybe use to make a model that makes sense, or at least to that we can use to understand the data. And again, we're moving towards making a predictive model. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry, it's down below. I was like, where, where'd it go? All right, so feature engineering, again, it's using data to create new data, to create new features that you would then use in models. Um, the obvious thing that he goes to right away is um, if we're looking at this daily data, let's figure out what weekday um, the date is. Uh, and we're going to label it. That's just the function w day. And I thought it was really interesting that he had in the exercises um, write a function that moves Sunday to the end of the week, Monday to the beginning. And I was like, yeah, you already did. Well, you or your team already did that, Hadley. You just say week start equals one. And it'll say that the week starts on Monday. And so I did what he said would be easier. Clearly, it was that that argument didn't exist when he wrote the book. Um, and so anyway, so I just moved it to where Sunday is the end of the week instead of the beginning. That way, Saturday and Sunday are grouped together. And you can see it. I do find it really interesting that, and he just discusses it a little bit. Saturday is weird. Sunday is messy. It's like, it's a little bit like Saturday and a little bit like Monday. It's somewhere in between, but weekdays are all, or for the most part, they're about the same. Like weekdays are when people do a lot of their traveling um, in the data that's in flights at least. All right, so then we're gonna make a model out of that weekday. So how many flights are there per day? And we're going to um, look at that uh, data with the predictions and put a point for the prediction versus the, the plot that we just had of, of the averages or of the whatever of the data per day. And we can see that our prediction, actually, our prediction for Saturday is pretty darn good. It's like right at the median, um, does a pretty good job. Every other day, we're, we are uh, under predicting a little bit the actual values. Um, but that's because there are all these outliers. So these outliers are making things a little weird that our, the, the model cares about the outliers more than it should, basically. And so can we do something with that? Can we make these outliers make sense? So again, um, more explicitly, let's look at the residuals and uh, see what we can see. So he puts a reference line at zero. That is where we want to be. And when we plot it, um, we can see that we have like early in the year, we always um, we always over predict. And then there's, yeah, that's not too bad. And then there's a period where we un always under predict and then not too bad. And then, oh God, a horrible mess at the end of the year. Um, and then, and there are these certain dates throughout the year that we are way, way, way off. We'll talk about those a little bit in a little bit or, you know, um, towards the end. Um, but yeah, okay, that's the overall trend. He also looks at um, by weekday. So if we just do a color, different color for each weekday and look at it, we can see that, oh, we're okay. Oh, what's going on here? That Saturdays in the uh, like late summer, early fall, we're, we're way under and we're way, or sorry, we're way over here and we're way under here. So something weird's going on there. Um, all days, uh, like uh, Mondays in the summer, were pretty bad. Just generally, summer were pretty bad. Um, and, and but we can see that there are, like, there's this, there is some smoothness to it. So it, it's it's largely captureable, basically. That's what he's showing with the smooth. Um. Uh, going off on a little bit of a tangent, we, we look at the residuals that are way low and 
um, something that I found really interesting doing this is like, I can tell already looking at it. So we're looking at residuals that drop below this negative 100 line. Um, I guess that does end up getting um, most of them. There's also some that are way that are above, like quite a bit above. But the fact like these two fall below the 100 line, but they're not as big of a weird thing as these ones, you know, relative to the things around them. And I just I thought that was an interesting that even our cutoff is a little bit getting a mix because uh, our, our model, you know, we haven't included it enough in our model yet. Um, but if you look at them like those two, uh, January 1st, okay, that, that makes sense to be lower than usual. Uh, the next one is um, Martin Luther King Day. So that's slightly less travel on MLK. Not every business uh, is closed on MLK Day. So you still get quite a bit. Um, this is uh, Memorial Day. It was the Sunday of Memorial Day. That was way low. Um, the, uh, was it, well, the 4th and 5th of July. That's unsurprising. It's Labor Day. Um, and then Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's again. Um, so you can kind of see, like, I, I was really tempted at this point to just pull those dates out for modeling. Like, oh, yep, my model's going to suck on holidays. And I think if I were really doing this, that's what I would do is just ignore those specific days when I'm building the model until I can come back and try to sort out what's going on on holidays because they, they're um, explainable outliers. Now I said kind of, because I'm not sure that I'd pull MLK day out. It's, it's a little weird, but it's not that weird. Um, and it's not good statistical practice to just arbitrarily pull out some days, but it, like Christmas, you know, Christmas, of course, it's weird. Um, so anyway, so that's, it. he looks at that. We don't fully deal with that by the end. And I, I did a little bit of playing, but it's actually kind of hard to um, auto label. Like the 5th of July is really hard to auto label because I'm not sure the 5th of July matters as much if it's not a Friday. Like if the 5th were a Tuesday, it would probably be more normal. And so that's part of the complication that's going on here. Um, but so barring those, we're looking, he, he decides to look by season, specifically by um, like school term, not by season. I say, I say season, but it's more uh, the fall term, the spring term, and then the summer in between those is how he divides it up because that tends to impact travel a lot. Um, so he puts in some semi-arbitrary breaks for these terms and makes a function that will just label our data. So we can take our daily and label that with a term. And then we make a new model, which we use a different model for it, but we're not gonna talk about why, because just because it works better. And again, this isn't about modeling, it's about like using models. Um, but so we're using RLM and we're looking at the weekday and its interaction with the term. So. Saturdays in spring are different than Saturdays in summer are different than Saturdays in fall, as far as our model is concerned. And then we look at the residuals and much better, like all of these, you know, depending on what you're doing, that might be accurate enough like that. That's explaining most of the difference. The early spring term, not so much. And he doesn't finish. Um, it was interesting to me, like, but this, Going with the kind of the theme of the chapter, you know, we can see our leftovers, our holidays, like when we pull those dates out, that those are still the same days and those make sense. But there's something else going on in the like January and February, maybe into March a little bit. Um, it, it, I would say it's like spring break onward becomes normal, but before spring break, no one wants to do anything. You know, you're burnt out from Christmas. Uh, which, uh, although I'm saying that backwards again, because we are, no, yeah, no, these are residuals. This is where we're over predicting um, how much travel there would be. And there just isn't as much in January and February. Um, so that would be a new thing to take into account in the model. You know, he did one where he does it by month and it gets uh, messy um, versus like it, it's, it's adding too much um, 
too much room for error, basically. He talks about doing it. He doesn't actually show it. Um, but I, I feel like, you know, you would want to put in a factor of, is it January or February in your, if you were doing an actual predictive model versus is it not? Um, but yeah, again, it, it was just kind of exploring. You can, you can quickly see like that term thing had a huge impact on making our model. If we scroll back up to here, we had lots of stuff that's like off of the line. And here we're on that same scale and we're much closer to the line. So that was um, probably a real predictor or it's because it's still pretty wrong here. It's a, an approximation of a real predictor. Maybe season would be more important than term, for example. Uh, maybe something about the weather would be more important. Um, but you can see that you're starting to understand the data a little better. And that, again, is more the point of the chapter than about trying to make a prediction of um, you know how busy the airport's going to be or whatever. Um, I also, I do find it interesting that the ones where it's really wrong, um, like even if you had a model, if the model told you that Christmas was going to have the same traffic at the airport as any other random day, you would be like, you would just know, it, no, it isn't, you know, I don't know. I don't know for sure if it's going to be higher or lower, but it's not going to be average and on Christmas day. Um, and then, you know, like right around Christmas, right around Thanksgiving, you're going to get fluctuations of travel that people are traveling before Thanksgiving and after Thanksgiving, but not necessarily on Thanksgiving because they're all wherever they're going to be on that day. So, um, so the ones that it's bad at, you know, you don't need a model to help you explain why it's bad. But the the season thing was something that he was able to get some insight just by looking at the residuals. Um, I thought that was cool. All right. So then he has a section on learning more. I uh, changed that section because um, we have book clubs. <laughs> and these are what I would recommend for learning more. So we have ISLR, um, the statlearning.com. Um, the book is actually called An Introduction to Statistical Learning with Applications in R. Uh, this one is like the statistical, um, I say explanations, but the, like the, the statistics of different types of models and um, also how to use those models in R. This one is, it's um, a good introduction to, you know, what's the difference between um, a random forest and a linear model or different types of linear models. Um, what are things, considerations to keep in mind when you're modeling? Um, I'm finding it super helpful. Uh, so I, I, I do recommend that one. Like I said, I really wish there was a nice, quick, uh, lower level intro of just what's the difference between a linear model and a, um, a forest type of model and then going into the different types of linear or random forests um, is where or different types of forests is where this book comes in. I don't know what it it's still really useful. All right. Uh, next there's tidy modeling with R. Again we have a book couple of that. That one is actually officially um, on its way to publication now, although it's not until I think October they plan to print it. Um, but it's online and free. And um, it's an introduction to using the tidy models family of packages to build predictive models. It has some um, assumptions that you know something about the types of models. Like it, it goes into explaining them, but it's more like, how do you do a random forest in tidy models? Not what is a random forest as much. So that's where like you can go back and forth, but I think I would do ISLR before tidy models. Um, Feature engineering and selection. Wait, I have a oh, question. Go ahead. Yep. Um, what you said it's a, an opinionated introduction. Is yeah. That so that's a term that actually um, I, it gets used a lot about like packages and things, and I hadn't seen it before, so I'm sorry about that, and thank you for calling it out. It's um, it's not just um, here's how to model. It's here's how to model the way we think you should model. Um. Off, uh, tidyverse is an opinionated framework for data analysis because it makes it easy to do the things that Hadley thinks you should do, basically. 
and it doesn't make it easy to do things that are harder um, or not harder, things that are not within the frameworks of what he would normally do. Um, it's uh, to a degree. Um, it It's also like opinionated in that it thinks that making the code easy to read is important, whereas other people don't think that's important. Um, and so that's part of the opinionated uh, framework. And so tidy modeling is opinionated. It's like, this is how we think you should model. Um, and here are tools to do it our way. Um, it's really good. And I, they talk a lot about the whole philosophy within the book about like they try to make it where you can accidentally do the right thing instead of accidentally doing the wrong thing. Um, that's part of their principle of design. And I think that's a good principle. Um, Feature Engineering and Selection uh, is another book by the same, the um, Max Kuhn who runs the tidy modeling team about um, all that stuff about like engineering your data to find uh, variables that are better for modeling. Um, I haven't read this one yet, but my understanding is it's really great at like understanding how to work with your data better, how to, how to, you know, things like pulling the term out of uh, the, a date and thinking of things in that way. Um, different standards for how you might need to change, like, you know, date data has a whole family of things you might want to do to it versus, uh, you know, something that's more like mass might have its own types of things you want to do to it. So there's that. And then applied predictive modeling um, is one that Hadley recommends in this book. Um, it's old. Uh, it was published about 10 years ago. And so tidy modeling with R came out much more recently. And he started to update applied predictive modeling to use the tidy modeling framework. My feeling on this is that applied predictive modeling is kind of like tidy modeling, but more with the why to use each type of model. So it's kind of in between ISLR and tidy modeling with R maybe. Um, I don't know yet, I haven't read it yet, um, but that is one that gets recommended a lot. And Max started a project to rewrite it for tidy modeling with R, but that project has been on hold while they finished uh, tidy modeling with R. Um, so yeah, what I said is despite that it's recommended in R for DS, um, I wouldn't recommend reading this one right now un unless you're doing so as part of the project to make it the tidy version because it is old, it's out of date. Even if you were working um, with uh, Carrot, which is the package that it was written to go with, I think Carrot has changed since it was written. And so it even, there probably wouldn't be super great. But if you are prepared to like acknowledge that and do some translation like we had to do in R4DS um, to translate the, the tidyverse, everyone says it's really good. I just, I haven't read it yet and I know it's somewhat out of date. All right, so that's all I got. Um, does anyone have any, any questions about all of this? And if you don't mind, I was going to add a comment to uh, Becky's question about the opinionated thought process of tidyverse. Go for it. So there's in in the in the mindset of not just computer science, computer programming uh, languages, on and on and on. Um, if anybody's discovered the Zen of Python, so this is a this is a kind of the Ten Commandments of of how you work with Python. And I I listened to a podcast, uh, I think it was yesterday, the day before, but they had brought this up as in the world of data science, there's multiple ways to achieve the same goal, right? And so you've got your different languages and you've got your different um, storage mechanisms and how you manipulate and, and ingest data, et cetera, et cetera. One of the differences between the world of R versus the world of Python, and that again, I'm being completely agnostic to whatever <laughs> choice our team wants to choose. Um, the Python was built in the idea that you always follow the same protocol. And even within their compiler, the, the, the actual um, syntax or the, the tab delimited separation of, of how the code looks is 
potentially an error that you have to be aware of. So everything kind of looks and feels right. the same way. Within this concept of this opinionated tidyverse uh, side of things, you have base R and you have tidyverse. And so the, the real difference between the community is what do we choose? Well, we started really early on in the R4DS book of it doesn't matter what you choose, just stick with it. And right. I, I may, maybe that's not in R4DS. Maybe that was in, in Mastering Shiny or EPGS. Yeah. But where it doesn't matter what your team chooses, just as long as you take a path and stick with it. Don't try and mix languages <laughs> uh, or mix methods because all you're going to do is have a big mess of confusion. And that's ultimately, uh, Becky, to your benefit of asking the question of what does the word opinionated imply? That, it's, yeah. This is, yeah, this is a recommendation <laughs> that we have for you if you choose to follow this path. Um, I, John, I, I know you, you've sp stated multiple times that, that you're taking the track of, of the, uh, tidyverse, uh, yes. uh form of, <laughs> of your, your entire method of authoring and, 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 and crunching numbers, et cetera. I've tried to stay in a, I don't know, 50, 50 line between it. Like you can go this way or you can go that way and I can help in either direction you want to go. But what that ends up doing is just really kind of spreading you pretty thin um, because you've got to be able to literally compare. Here's one model that you can, or here's one method you could do it. And here's another method. And, oh, by the way, there's this well, third, fourth and 10th. Anyway, sorry. I, so I would say um, I recommend starting with uh, tidyverse as the, the framework that you think in. Um, I do fair amount now in base um, in when I'm writing packages for what I do so that the work I do day to day can still feel tidy. But when you're writing a package that is comes out as tidy, sometimes under the hood, it's got some more base style coding in it. Um, like every once in a while, we have to rewrite something to make it. Uh, a little bit more performant um, for whatever we're doing. And sometimes that means taking out some of the tidy way of looking at things. Um, and it, you do end up with code that's much harder to understand. And so we have to be really careful explaining why we did it this way, that it's it was slow and uh, we needed to do some some rearranging, like even just using the pipe, the, uh, the tidyverse pipe is a little bit of a cost in as far as, um, speed and, and RAM use. Tiny, tiny cost, but it can add up if you're doing it a ton. Um, so sometimes it'll just be a matter of just rearranging the code. So it's not as easy to read anymore. It's a bunch of nested parentheses, um, but it performs a little better. That's pretty rare. And now actually you can use the base R uh, pipe in most cases to get rid of that problem because the base R pipe does not have any performance uh, issues. Um, but then that adds the issue of if you use the base R pipe, anyone who's using your code has to also be using a recent version of R. Anyway, all of that is to say, yeah, I um, opinionated is good in code in my mind. Like um, the one thing that actually bothers me about Python is they're opinionated eventually. Go on Twitter and ask someone how to install Python and you will see that Python is not, everyone has an opinion, an opinion but the language as a whole does not have an opinion because they can't tell you how to install Python and agree on it. No two people will tell you the same thing. Forbid um, anybody for, for getting involved in environments, Python environments, that's a yeah. whole just, yeah. Versus for the most part, 90% of people for R will tell you, you know, install R, install R Studio and use R Studio as your development environment. Like that's just a standard. Um, not everyone does, like there are, there are different, development environments for R, but it's common enough that people think that R Studio is R, like, you know, they get merged in people's heads. So I like opinionated frameworks. I think it's a good way to learn. Um, and really almost anything you learn, you're learning an opinionated framework. Like when you learn to diagram sentences, that's just something someone made up once, you know, like these are, everything is opinionated frameworks. Um, so doing it within a programming language, I think is good. And then especially on a team that you're working with, um, we have a lot of conventions that don't strictly matter, but because we always do it, it makes our code easier for us to read for each other. Um, 
like we always explicitly use return statements in our functions, whereas you don't actually need to. In R, whatever you do last in the function gets returned, but sometimes it's hard to see what that would be, or more so, sometimes it's easy to forget. Like you'll assign something, but then not actually return that thing. And since we say you have to explicitly return, when we're reviewing each other's codes, code, we can look for that explicit return. If it's missing, that's just a thing that we know is missing. That's, again, like um, I have a, a tweet exchange with Headley that he thinks that that's useless and that you shouldn't do that. But I'm very opinionated that you should. So uh, different things like that, like just having conventions is really useful. Um, we document even our unexported functions, which no one else does. But we do that because we want to be able to explain to future us why did we write this function and just um, and having a little documentation on it is useful, things like that. Uh, anyway, so we're off on a tangent here, but. John, can I yeah. ask a question? Would you mind sharing your uh, presentation again, just to sure. the very first uh, plot? Sure. Uh... So this is just about how to generate a plot because I'm working on something very similar, in fact, the... so. There? Uh, or yes so can okay. you scroll to the first plot that has yeah perfect oh okay so when you do this right um mm -hmm. it's carrot and price how do you get the count to be um so if you wanted for example the legend count to be a thousand to five thousand in that order mm -hmm. so increasing how would you do that i'm not sure um I'm really not sure. Uh, okay. I would have to sit down with. Um, uh, you do you do the the guides. Okay. And then and then inside, if like the the legend, the guide legend. Can you type um, it out, Federica, into the chat? Maybe. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll search. Um, give give me a second. I'll search the uh, on the internet, and then I'll put the link. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say Lydia just went over okay. this on ggplot uh, last uh, Monday, so I was gonna uh, say I'm gonna go search that chapter that she was conducting. Uh, it's the same so thing Frederica's after. That so, okay. That does remind me that um, I, I I'm kind of thinking about at the end of this club having a week where we just talk about all the book clubs um, that yeah. we have running and where people might want to go next because. You know, this is kind of this is largely the first book. Like this is the one that this is where you start. That's why our, you know, our 4DS online learning community is named after this book because this is where you start. Um, and there are so many options for the next book. And so I, I think I will do a week where I just kind of walk through what are all the other clubs that we have running or that we could spin back up, and, uh, like where should you start you know because like i said i if you are not familiar with different types of models i would recommend islr before tidy modeling with r for example mm -hmm. um you can do those in either order but i think you get more like i actually think i'm going to read tidy modeling with r again after reading islr um so anyway putting things in kind of a sequence like that um and ggplot2 is one that could be your next book for sure if you do a lot of visualization, that one uh, dives into how to do it. Then there, or there's Mastering Shiny. If you do a lot of, if or if you want to do a lot of like interactive dashboard type stuff, um, that would be a good place to go. Or if you Ooh. plan to do a lot of modeling, go into Tidy Modeling with R or ISLR or I don't know. Um, we yeah, there's lots of options. So <laughs> as a preview. <laughs> Um, we'll probably do that as a, a part of a week after all the weeks. Um, oh, we also could do a book club about specifically our markdown, which was coming up next. So speaking of next week, um, let's see, I want to unshare. Um, oops. Uh, what do we have? We're starting the, our, or no, we're not, next week is Ryan. Uh, talking about many models, and that's the one that's all about list columns. Um, that one, the modeling itself is 
really not that much of the focus in the that chapter it it talks about working with many models and i think like i'm sure that chapter is just merged into a totally different chapter now because it's all about using the special type of column called list column and the cool things you can do with that um well that's basically what the tidy r package is all about so this is the chapter on the tidy r package and it's disguised as a modeling packet or my modeling chapter um so yeah we've got that and then just a couple more weeks after that we've got becky with the beginning of the um communication stuff uh federica is going to take the gt plot chapter and then sandra has the last two chapters which really i i looked at that the very last chapter is like a page um yeah. and so we're gonna do those two together pretty definitely um and that's it then we're done so it's very exciting <laughs> All right. Any other I got questions? The, um, I got the links from Ryan and Federico. Thank you so much. Yeah, I had the. I think I was using scale gradient fill. What was it? Um, scale fill gradient two, and then adding breaks, but it still didn't necessarily flip. Um, yeah, that's one of those that I don't increasing. I, yeah. I never yeah, know you, off can, the you top can of use. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You can use both. Uh, it depends by the, the guides is a, another option for um, setting this, these things. But if you, if you have a, a scale color, uh, you might, mm, you, you can do some things, but not, but not everything. So okay. you might need the guides uh, function. And then inside you specify that it, it is a color bar. And then mm -hmm. inside the function color bar, you ask to for, for reversing uh, the value. There, right. There's few options. Um, I, I, I'll put more uh, precise information on Slack, but there's okay. different options that you can use. Uh, so you can reverse the, the value uh, on the data set before making the plot as well, if you... So you then make it simply a, a plot sim as simply as that, as it is. And uh, so you just see, manipulate okay. your data before making yeah, it. Yeah, like the, the data frame, yeah. Yeah. I thought about that, yeah. But OK, that sounds good. Thank you so much. So I will check up on the Slack. OK. All right, anything else? All right, I think, oops, I think I will see everybody next week. Bye. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs>